you learn about DNA already, you learn about biology molecular, and you learn about taxonomy. So the guest professor, Professor Erwin Beck, will explain the mixing of that biology molecular, taxonomy, and DNA, and etc. So I hope it will give us a, a new perspective. Yeah, it's just coming. Thank you. So yeah, if there is some question, because this is also live in YouTube, so some of you can open the YouTube channel because I cannot open the YouTube channel. So please help us if there is, because it broadcasts outside the biology ETS. So if there is some question, it should be, you help me to to put it uh, to Professor D. Okay, uh, Bu Dewi, you want to say something? No? Okay, yeah. No, I think she, she is good. Okay, thanks, Dirk. So we can start. All right. Thanks, Edwin, for the for the nice introduction here. And good to see you all. For those that don't know me, I'm Dirk Erdenbeck. I'm a lecturer in uh, the LMU in Munich, and uh, where uh, Dr. Edwin used to be for quite a substantial time of his life and did his PhD with me, etc. And I'm, of course, I'm grateful that you invited me over to tell you a little bit about some research I'm doing here and uh, certainly also to foster a little bit of collaboration. And he asked me to give you a kind of lecture about evolution and systematics in particular. And I understand that you just start getting into systematics and uh, I don't know exactly how your curriculum is and will be in the next couple of uh, weeks and months. But what I'm doing here now is actually try to start a little bit slow and raise you a bit of your awareness on some of the pitfalls and problems that might occur when you later will deal with trees, with phylogenies, etc. So you are in the how many semester, master, second, third, fourth, third, master. Okay, good. So it's rather fresh. All right. Good. So now, when we, when we, when we, yeah, right. Right? This butterfly doesn't do anything because somehow it does not find the remote here. Let's try it again. Ah, there we go. Bunch of butterflies. Four. Four butterflies here. They probably have had at a certain moment a kind of relationship, familiar relationship to each other. Yeah. So if we get out of time, zoom out of time here a bit, we will see that. A little bit. Uh, change it a little in a way. Otherwise, it will not find the remote here. That works. We will see that. We do not see it. In fact, we do not see that at all. Definitely. So, they are connected in a way due to their parents which of course had a bunch of offspring. And uh, if we go further, further out of time in this way, we suddenly notice that within generations, we find a clear network between all of them. And if we go out of time further and further, these generations suddenly form populations, which in turn is a sufficient population, so populations of those guys that can interbreed with each other without any kind of problem. And several populations finally form species. So we see this network, we get denser and denser and denser, and out of these species, we get, we get, Many things connected there. So now nothing is. I'll try again. You don't get to be fine. There we go. Everything up and running. Help me out. Which button to? Okay, good. Ah, 
Now it's working. Thanks a lot. That's good. Good. All right. So if we have more of this network together, we get finally lineages. And these lineages can be species, these can be genera, this can be basically anything. And these lineages are actually the mo most important thing we talk about when we talk about evolution. Because these lineages can be then easily be translated into a tree, into a phylogenetic tree. That tells us how things are related with each other and help us telling us other stuff. So the basic idea of these phylogenetic trees that you all have probably seen at some stage a phylogenetic tree is that we have here two lineages, lineage C and D, for example, they have been fine so far. They had one last common ancestor somewhere out of which the two lineages originated. It is somewhere in the past. He is the last common an an ancestor of lineage C, D, and E. B, unfortunately, had a pretty lousy time went extinct for any kind of reason we don't know. However, it's still a lineage which occurred in the past. However, we do not see it currently in the past. And together with lineage A, we have a last common ancestor somewhere down there at, the, at this bottom. So this ancestor is therefore the root of this tree and the last common ancestor with all the features out of which the other lineages reach. This tells us now quite some nice story not only about the relationships, we can also use these lineages and these relationships to each other to understand more about the evolution by, for example, inferring again, yeah, again, but I guess this is right. Yeah. So, so these phylogenetic trees can not only tell us how things are related, but we can also use these trees for other questions. So for example, how did characters evolve, morphological characters evolve throughout time? There is a different depiction of the tree here. Now, on the lineages, of course, very graphically here, we see what could have happened in the evolution of sauropsids, which kind of character changes occurred so that we get the final terminal taxa, the, the terminal things as we see in its uh, edited. So they help us to understand character. Trees can also help us to answer other questions. For example, the so called molecular clocks. Have you heard about molecular clocks before? You know what a molecular clock is? Yeah, who has not heard about molecular clocks? Okay, so you all have heard about molecular clocks? Who has heard about molecular clocks? Who doesn't know if he or she has heard about molecular clocks? Okay, good, no problem. A molecular clock is that we use the DNA and evolutionary time and the evolution changes of the DNA to trace back what has happened in terms of timing of the individual. So this is a very nice example of the molecular clock approach. From 2008, what has happened here? The question has been asked, did the death of the dinosaurs lead to the fact that the mammals originated. So what they did in this analysis is they sequenced DNA from all kinds of mammal lineage. So hares, rabbits, rodents, bears, whatever. So every single lineage is here and apply the molecular structure. And this molecular clock then finally was checked against that time when the dinosaur went, went extinct at the Cretaceous Tertiary boundary, something like 68 million years ago. You know, when the big comet uh, or the meteor fell somewhere to Mexico and uh, the dust cloud 
shaded everything and uh, caused just the large extra groups that we had in this time on Earth to expand. Here is the timeline. This is the moment of the extinction of the dinosaur. We, however, see that all the major plates of the um, of the um, of the mammals they were already present. They are already present since almost one hundred, maybe even more hundred millions of years ago. The death of the dinosaurs, which occurred at this moment, did not change something regarding whether a new lineage occurred or not. It's just that the radiation with a number of lineages increased, but the major lineages like uh, Lagomorphs or like rodents or whatever else, they were already this is another nice story to uh, to see how important phylogenetic trees are for us. And also in these days, which one? Shadow A couple of years ago, a couple of months ago, actually, it's coming to Think of the pandemics, COVID. Molecular clocks help us also to trace back who has been the first person that has been infected. You've seen how important it is to find who was the first person who got in contact with the coronavirus to trace back what had happened. And this is uh, possibly with phylogenetic trees and these molecular clocks as well. Here, an example for HIV, for instance, from the 90s, but the same for coronaviruses. Here, the, where here was the patient zero, third person infected. He infected the patient number one, patient two, patient three, patient four, and so on. And the virus in this patient kept on evolving. So we understand how the virus is evolving. Uh, yeah, but I would know how. Can we? Okay, please go ahead. Yeah, some people upset and Yeah. Um, okay, yeah. Yeah. I'm clear? Yeah. Good. Okay. So, all right. So, you see, also on shallow level, yeah, we're not talking about hundreds of million years, but just a couple of days or weeks. These help us, for example, for medical application and to understand how. Uh, the pandemic is original. So you see now that trees so systematically are important. But I ask you guys, how do we now definitely find the correct phylogeny or whatever we'd like to investigate? What do we need to reconstruct a good phylogenetic tree? Or let's say, what do we need for a perfect, robust, most correct tree? That tree that helps us understanding how did mammals evolve? How did dinosaurs evolve? What do we need ideally for a correct phylogeny? Yes, please. No. no, 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 because it's also the DNA sequence. No, yeah. Okay. Will the DNA sequence help, help us to make 100% sure that we have the correct, that we have the current phylogeny? Well, if I ask like that, probably not. No, <laughs> but well, good point actually. But don't worry, I, I get back, I will get back to the later. <laughs> So to now understand what had happened hundreds of million years ago in terms of evolution of organisms, what do we need? Ideally, but they won't tell us too much. Huh? Sorry. 
sorry, don't worry, I'm, 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 I'm actually pulling a little bit here. You are there on a good way, but what will answer all our questions in this report? Do you know what it is? A time machine. Do we have a time machine yet? Do we, guys? No, unfortunately not. So therefore, we have to go back and follow, for example, your suggestion. So we can only indirectly now infer phylogeny, what has happened. We have to take data, like you suggested, DNA data, molecular data, chromosomal data, behavioral data, yeah, and indirectly check out with the help of this data what has happened. This data, however, has to be consisting of homologous. You know what homologous means? That means it's one originated, one originated once, and then just changed to all kinds. And due to the fact that evolution is rather lazy, the changes only occur just a few times or hardly. And therefore, all of these things that have the same changes, we believe they all are closely related to each other. So we can therefore choose of DNA data or morphological data and come up with a data set which helps us in this respect. So for example, we will take the morphological data of which we think it's called homologous, yeah, like eyes or fur or head or whatever else, call it somewhere, put it into some fancy phylogenetic algorithms, yeah, and make a tree out of that. All right? So far, so easy. Important is, and you will at some stage probably reconstruct a tree. Important, important is that you think in advance what kind of characters you choose to answer your question. So, an easy example. You know this guy here? Okay, who doesn't know that? Good. Welcome, grab a seat. Good. These guys here. If you'd like to do a morphological systematic of that, a morphological data set, you will not have any kind of problems here, I guess. Yeah, you would put together all those with a black nose. Yeah, and would say they are probably related to each other. Yes, they are mammals, yeah, mice and, and dogs and, and the cat on the far right. You would put all those together which are weak, yeah, because, well, they are unique here and of course a monotheric group they are they are ducks so far yeah and maybe you would refine your data set by saying all those with these big pointy ears yeah they probably are closer related to each other yes because they both are mice and no problem here however you can also infer errors here. Mm -hmm. if you'd say i regard all of them closely related which are very glass and strangely enough, in the Disney universe here, um, the Mickey and Minnie and uh, Daisy and uh, this guy on the right hand side, maybe a glass for any strange reason, Pluto doesn't. So, if you would then take glass as a character, you would infer an error because Goofy, a dog as well as, as Pluto, for any kind of reason, he is different than me, but you know, both are dogs, he has glass, as you can see here, he does. So you would infer an error. So you have to think twice whether these features that you code all your systematics and you use in the tree can be are useful or not. Okay, so far so good, so easy, right? Now try to make a molecular phylogeny, sorry, a morphological phylogeny, not with these guys. So now you see you have some trouble because you know, because you're smart, 
taking a, a, the C charts, the differences we see here in the C chart are not that are not that big. Both have yellow beaks, both have feathers. Uh, the only thing which is different here might be the, the head, the hair, or whatever else, yeah? And you know this is nothing we should use for the fighting of the head. So you know, this morphology, I will not be able to refer to phylogenesis. So you have to think in advance what kind of character set you're choosing to reconstruct the six Okay? Because these guys are too closely related to be resolved with a phylogenetic data set based on morphology. Another example. A potato, a snail, Miss Universe from 2016. Make a phylogeny of these three. Who is closer related to who? If you wouldn't know that gastropods and and uh, primates are both animals, yeah, then just looking at them, you wouldn't be able to formulate a character which combines two of these three guys. Because it's two different morphology, two different binary concepts. So therefore, your data set, your morphological data set will not be able to help you here. So you have to think in advance, what kind of character can I choose to reconstruct for intelligence? Unfortunately, independently, if things are shallow, related to each other, or very deep split between them, so hundreds of millions, or probably even uh, several, probably even billions of years that separate the plants from, uh, from, the, from the animals. But there should be something combining it. And we find, of course, as life has just one single origin somewhere 3.8 billion years ago, and all the life is based on DNA data, we should find on our homology DNA data. A routine which is efficient to resolve all these organisms here to this application. So you can follow now finally give advice and have a look at the molecules, which are in this respect very helpful because all organisms have DNA, all of them have some genes, so called housekeeping genes, which are used. Independent if you're bacterium or whether you are Homo sapiens, it doesn't matter. And the DNA everywhere, it doesn't matter where you look at, is in our nuclear genome, uh, nicely tied up and uh, with a bunch of genes, with a defined start, with a defined end. So what we can actually do in molecular systematic, we just grab for all these organisms, we just grab one sequence and have a look at that how it might have evolved within the last couple of you know, millions or hundreds of millions or whatever years. So that's what we also, of course do. We just now take a sequence, assuming, now let's take a sequence from 30 million years ago. Let's just focus on one thing. stretch here for, uh, for, uh, for, for the ease of explaining. 30 million years ago, there was a population of these organisms and they, uh, they um, were doing well. 20 million years later, we suddenly noticed out of this founder population have been now two additional populations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one here looking the same and one had a change at this position here. This A changed to a T, so a mutation, right? How do mutations occur? How do mutations occur? We all consist out of lots, lots of DNA. Our DNA is different from all the DNA we see outside in the trees or in the forest, etc. The reason are mutations. What causes 
all these mutations that cause us that we all are looking different and that we are completely different from the trees outside and everyday lives. What causes mutations? Ladies, gentlemen, biologists. That comes afterwards. There's a mutation. And then we see later on if this adaptation works. Okay. So first we have to be different, either the positive or negative way, and then comes what you mean the natural selection. But how does this mutation come first? This change here from A to a T. How does it come? Where does it come from? Oh, you mean a recombination? In that moment, the mutation should already be there. Yeah? So we, you see then in, in, in your children, how does a DNA strand change its nucleotides? Molecular biologists here. Come on. You all have a, a bachelor degree. How do mutations occur? Who is comfortable with who's comfortable having them? Who does it? Yes, but how? At what moment in your biological cycles? How does it happen? When? And it happens at every moment now, now that we speak in your body, in my body as well. Again? Okay. Yeah, well, well, once again, did you say mitosis or meiosis? No, we are talking. And namely, in that moment that the DNA polymerase during the mito mitosis makes a new copy. In that moment, the, 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 the DNA polymerase grabs a new nucleotide, but sometimes it makes accidents, puts in therefore a wrong nucleotide. And this change, if it's not if it's beneficial, then it stays in the population. Maybe they're, they're stronger, they're bigger, whatever. If not, they might not make it too long. But first, it's nothing else than random errors of the DNA tumor. 99.999% of all the changes that we have, that, uh, that uh, we all look different, but just based on these accidents, these errors, which then subsequently get fixed due to natural selection or other things. And they occur all the time. For example, if I'm in the sun, get a nasty sunburn, yeah? I pretty fair skin, unfortunately, yeah? What's happening? There are lots of mutations. These, these mutations, okay, they will not make it into the next generation, yeah? Because they're just in my skin and uh, so it doesn't have to do with the production so far, yeah? But the mutations, they are sure, continue, continuous. Most mutations are due to polymerase. All the other mutations, uh, so such as mutagenic reagents, regulations, stuff like that, it does not matter at all. Evolution is taking all these factors. But if you ask next time, what is evolution? It's nothing else than just the change of your genetic makeup to our time. This is then driven by random change. Okay. First a change, and then we see if nature likes that or not. Yeah, or if we are directly eaten up by uh, by a lion because our mutation makes us big and slow and whatever. Yeah, or maybe it's beneficial. That's a change has to be, and this is due to the random at every moment the same before. This, uh, of course, goes on and on and on. After 10 million years after, and in the present time, after 10 million years, we see something is changing again. This group splits up into other groups, which here, for example, see a different genotype, or here this T uh, stays here the same, but instead this G changes here to a T, and so on. This was 10 million years ago, and now at the present, 
we have some changes again out of the image, we suddenly get a species of new species. We, however, do not know how these guys look like because they're dead, decomposed, buried. We don't find them anymore. The only thing we have is our that we can select, out of which we can remove DNA. And the, and the rest, how they're related to each other, how they're related to each other, and uh, how the inter intermediates look like the ancestors look like, we know because they're all there. We, however, have this data, and not only this data, nucleotides, we also have information in here because we suddenly now see, look for similarities. All of them have here this position, it's here. maybe because they will think that they. Maybe they are closely related to each other because the chance that this random error occurs at the same position several times is very, very small. So probably they are all closely related to each other because they all have a T. Or here, these two, maybe, huh? Closely related because they have a T, right? All other have a G. All these guys here have they all have an A, and all the others don't have it. But we don't, don't only have eight. We have lots and lots of additional and with from which we can, with smart algorithms, find out who's probably closer related to who with these algorithms, and also learn deducting from this how then the last common ancestors here. And from this, we can then understand how, for example, it can occur that out of nothing, suddenly scales, later feathers originate, and uh, how suddenly we can walk on two legs uh, coming from four legs, etc., etc. We can therefore answer this is lots of things. So, therefore, what we will do then is huh, we will grab our organisms, let it be here this flying amber, and we sequence. Maybe some of you did that already in laboratory code. We extract the DNA until we are shiny happy scientists with a DNA uh, solution. Amplify this, the particular gene, which helps us understanding the relationships. Clean it up, we give it to sequencing, uh, get back raw data. And this raw data, we then further process, we make a, a data set out of that and apply a bunch of algorithms, and you're going to learn about these algorithms, I guess, in the course of this, uh, of this uh, you know, of the semester, of course, and you get, hooray, hooray, a phylogenetic So, this tree, you're happy at the moment. You sequence the gene, you amplify the gene, you expect the DNA before amplify the gene sequence it. You made a tree out of that, you show it to your supervisor and say, this answer for all my questions in my research project, whatever that is. And the supervisor will ask, hey, is this now the true tree? Is this now the true tree? You're still not having the time machine, right? Nothing changed since, yeah? Is this now the true tree? The relationship between all these organisms, yeah, based on this one single DNA marker with smart algorithms, and I got this tree out of that, and we we'll learn about how it works. But at the moment, is this how evolution was? What do you think? What do you think? Yes, no. Yes, you. Uh, okay, well, thank you. <laughs> Okay, let's let, let's start in the, in the back right hand side. Yes. Do you think this is a true tree? This is how it was in, in nature. It's like cool things, you know, DNA and stuff. Is this now the answer to all our questions? You can pass on the question. You're shaking your head. Your neighbor sh is shaking their head. She said, No, no, it's not. This thing. But she's not sure about it. The part of the question, what do you think? Is this a true tree? No, no. Yes no? or no? The question is only, oh, yes or no? 
Okay, well, who thinks who thinks is this is a true tree? Arms up. Okay. Who does not think this is a true tree? All right. Who does not know who is a, if it's a true tree or not? Okay, I guess. <laughs> no. Um, maybe. Maybe it's a true tree. Hopefully it's a true tree. It's our best friend. Don't forget. This tree we have is just based on a short part of DNA with a bunch of algorithms some smart people thought of. We are believing that this could actually solve all the genetic problems. So this snapshot of DNA, we hope that this represents the true point. We don't know, but it's our best guess so far. It's our good working hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Every, please do me a favor, every phylogenetic tree you'll ever see in a publication, independent if it's from Dr. Edwin or from me or from, or you do it yourself, is don't regard it as the true tree, which is 100% sure that, it will, uh, that this recapitulates the true history of it. We don't know unless we have a time machine. So far, it's just an hypothesis. Every tree you find in a publication is a hypothesis, and only a hypothesis. Funny enough, you see in very important uh, journals of nature, science, mm -hmm. a tree, and a couple of weeks later, for the same organisms, you see some, you're going to see some uh, examples here, in the same organisms, suddenly the tree is changed a couple of weeks later. So a tree is never the true and final statement as long as we don't have the time machine. We just our best. We try to do our best with very good algorithms, with very good DNA. So the problem mainly is we don't know. So a, the true tree is the so-called solution. The tree that is Therefore, uh, recapitulating how the species evolved throughout time. This tree is, however, only based on a gene or a gene fragment. And sometimes the gene tree not necessarily is the same as the species. The species, the true tree, yeah? Four fishes here, yeah? Last common ancestor. At a certain moment, we have a bunch of association events. Yeah, throughout time, we have here suddenly an event where uh, all those guys that have been here, at, at that moment, the, those on the right-hand side cannot mingle, interact, interbreed with those on the left-hand side. So we have, we have an isolation leading them to two different species here, association event. And the area that would be, uh, whatever reason, which separates the population here from the population here. Second speciation event here, next speciation event here. Here we have lineages which are definitely not interbreeding with each other anymore. This is depicting where species are building. The gene tree, however, not necessarily has to match this species. This makes our work easy. Yeast. Saccharomyces cerevisiae, that's a yeast from which you make beer. All the other uh, yeasts here, Candida, you might know it as a, as a which is a, an infectious uh, yeast uh, for skin. Whole genetic tree of yeast based on four different genes. Here is a gene, this is a gene, this is a gene, this is a gene. You see, all those four different gene trees are different. I wouldn't be swear, but I won't do that. So you see here, these guys are different here. These guys have a different relationship. These have a different, these have a different relationship. They're all beautiful, treated correctly, reconstructed from a certain gene. But they show different results. These inconsistencies are the reasons why we still 
don't have the final phylogenetic answer to all, and we still have to wait for the time machine. Where do these inconsistencies come from? And this is what I what will be my main message for you for today that every gene tree that you see can lead to lots of trouble. So, first of all, each choice of organisms you work with. This is a very simple data set consisting of amino acids from a bunch of uh, 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 vertebrates, all right? Unfortunately, chicken and humans somehow have lots and lots and lots of mutations acquired for this particular gene in this community. If you would make a normal phylogenetic tree, it will look like something like this one here making humans and chicken as a monophyletic group and all other mammals here, cow, mouse, rat, whatever, somewhere here, more distant away, assuming that we are closer to chicken than to all other mammals. Yeah, I, I don't want, I do not really see me as a chicken, so therefore there must be something wrong here, right? You see, these two guys have rather long branches. The length of this branch depicts the number of evolutionary changes in the data set. There's a reason a human and chicken for this gene got more and more mutations during mitosis, whatever, yeah, and therefore has these long branches. These long branches, yeah, different uh, depiction of these kind of trees. This is what the true tree would look like in case you have long branches. The last common ancestor group A and B, the last common ancestor of C and B, yeah. A, however, is a little bit weird, also looks a bit weird. That accumulated a lot of changes. B as well. B and C just look not too different from the last common ancestor. If you make a, a tree with the algorithm you're going to learn, you get an artifact, a so called long branch attraction, putting those guys together based on the fact that they just have long branches here suggesting you that this would be the true tree. It's exactly what we see over here. So the data set. You suddenly notice they have with the long branch. Be very careful in interpreting the data. Frequently occurring problem. But the bigger problem is that the gene, the evolution of the genes themselves might not all the time match that one of the species. The species tree, which is here black, the gene tree, gene number one, which is uh, the red one here, and another gene, gene number two. They might be evolved strangely, somehow differently than the species. Why is that? There's a bunch of reasons what I'd like to talk about with the cross. The first one, the so-called lineage. What is lineage sorting? Lineage sorting is, imagine again, our population of butterflies, right? Through our time. Connected somehow with it. Now, these are, every dot here is now not a butterfly, but every dot here is a copy of the genome. These gene copies get into the next generation. Sometimes from the mother, sometimes from the father. So some of these copies, some of these alleles might get lost. So you get your alleles from the mother and another alleles from the father. This kind of recombination, yeah, which makes us so lovely uh, different during recombination. So that means. How are then some of these guys, let's start here at the, at the bottom, how are they related with each other? Let's take this guy here and this guy, those in yellow. If we would trace back the last common ancestor of this gene copy here, these two guys would have their last common ancestor here. Yeah, but we say it's grandmother or grandfather, we don't know. To this guy here, we need a couple of additional generations until we get the last common ancestor of all these people. This can be now easily 
translated into a tree. Oh, I terminate too. Okay. The last common ancestor. And the last common ancestor of all of them, actually, over here. Mm. Is it time from here to here? Is it time from here to here? Is it time to go to here? Okay. So now let's have this together with some speciation events. Again, all our gene copies throughout time. Now, this is the oldest. This is the youngest here. So it's now upside down. Sorry about that. And we have here two barriers, which at a certain moment stop the gene flow in this population throughout time. Yeah, at this moment here, this, these guys cannot interact with these anymore. And with this barrier, these cannot interact with these anymore. What happened here? Now pick from here, from here, and from here. A gene copy and check out how they are related to each other. Okay, these are the speciation events. So we take this copy here, for example, this copy and this copy, and trace back where the last common ancestor of this gene copy has been. We see here for B and C, this has been the last common ancestor here, and the last common ancestor for all of them is down here. So therefore, this gene tree nicely reproducts, re uh, capitulate the original species tree. Based on this specimen, and this specimen, and this specimen with this gene copy, this gene copy, and this gene copy. If I would now have not taken this guy here, but if I would have made it take this guy, I would have taken another guy from this. Where would be the last common ancestor here? It would be here. I guess the last common ancestor shared the species A. And therefore, my gene tree looks here different. Now, favoring rather that A and B are together and C is distant from it. Because this split here is much too short. I would have waited now something like 15 more generations. These guys would have been sorted nicely in a way that we would get them, therefore, the same last common ancestor or comparable last common ancestor. This now means we have several specimens here sharing different evolutionary history of that particular gene copy. This makes everything a little bit difficult for our gene tree to recapitulate the tree usually. Other problems. Horizontal gene transfer. You know what it is? Horizontal gene transfer? Yeah? Never heard about that? No, not at all. Okay, horizontal gene transfer is that at a certain moment, an individual transfers the genes into the nucleus of another one. And, the, and these uh, genes with an origin be incorporated. This happens with bacteria. Yeah, they can exchange DNA easily with each other. This also happens, for example, during a virus infection. Every single virus infection of a real retrovirus you had is still somehow stored in your DNA. Leftovers of the virus. This is horizontal gene transfer. That the gene is transferred from one organ to another. What's happening there? Species A, species B, C, and D. The gene is nicely evolving, however, for any reason, species A transmits its DNA into species C. This messes up our phylogeny. You see here and here, this would be now closer than these to each other. Not so frequently occurring among mammals, but if you work with bacteria, it continues all the time. Other problems gene duplication and loss. Your genes can be copied and pasted to another place in the genome. What's happening? 
We have a duplication of a gene, which therefore looks identical, but somewhere else, somewhere else in the genome, and mutates and evolves the same way as the previous one. What happens then? It has its own phylogeny. The copy has its own phylogeny. Okay. Parallel. And if we have bad luck, we might then in our phylogeny compare the original genes, maybe from here and here, with the duplicates copies of this one and this one. And of course, this one and this one will look closer to each other than these two guys to each other, although they are closely related. Making our gene tree completely different to the species. Those copies coming from the same source are so-called so autologs. Those coming from the from a duplicate are paralogs. If we compare autologs with paralogs, we get a huge mess and we will not be able to fold and not And the last thing is so-called hybridization. Hybridization is if two lineages here, A and B and C, they're already nicely separated from each other. And then for any reason, we get some rebreeding, inbreeding again. We find it with corals, we find it frequently with flowers, we find it with lots of, lots of others. However, this pretty much messes up our phylogeny because the gene tree that we get there will be kind of different to our original species tree that we get. A lot of things so far to consider when you have your biology. That means the gene tree, you have the gene tree, again together, from gene number one. So let's see. Gene number one, A and B and C. Another gene might, for those reasons that I just mentioned, still look different. Therefore, we are now in the 2020s. We are not dealing that much with just one single DNA strand phylogeny. We are now in the genomic era where we can easily sequence entire genomes. And therefore, and therefore, ah, there we go. If I push long enough, then we get the signal. So, therefore, we are not taking single genes anymore. We now try to take entire the information of entire genomes to help us understand what's happening. And when the first genomes have been published, something like a couple of oh, 20, 30 years ago, when the first genomes have been published, there was a huge enthusiasm. Yeah, hooray! This incongruence of all the individual uh, gene trees has an end. Now we can take all the entire genome data and use this a plethora, a huge wealth of information. We can use them now for our phylogenies. Never any errors anymore. So out of this, then the so-called phylogenomic original. So using genomics for phylogenies, entire genomes. You have all a bachelor in biology. How big is your genome? How many nucleotides do you have in the nuclear genome of each of your cells? Almost each of your cells. How many nucleotides? How many base pairs? A, C, Gs, and Ts in each and every cell? If I would pull a hair, I would have the hair cell, the follicle. How many base pairs are there? No, don't look it up. You can look it up on the internet. You should know it. You're biologist. You should know. Homo sapiens, you. How much DNA in base pair do you have? Everyone suddenly some writing. All right. Good. Okay, guess. 
Okay. Yes. What do you think? Um, um not too, too, uh, yeah, yeah, don't do it. No, no, no. Yes, yes. Because my uh, answer is here. We have an answer here already. Yeah, yeah but I'm no more. That's overkill here. Yeah? That's but overkill. That's overkill. I'm not talking about genes. I'm talking about the nucleotides A, C, G, and C, the base pair. How big is your genome? Okay, if I would take my DNA out of a cell, yeah, the DNA stretch, yeah, with twice 23 chromosomes, if I'm, if I'm lucky, and I would tie them together, the entire thread would be one meter 80, one meter 80 in each of your cells. How many ACGs and Ts are in there? Yeah, about two meters. Yes, all right, good. <laughs> Good, but how many nucleotides are there? How many base pairs? That's the important question. What do you think? Come on, give me an educated guess. One billion, you say. Okay. Your neighbor. Ah, oh, no. come on. The lady next to you. Say it again. Almost two billion. The lady next to it. <laughs> but you have a laptop there if you look it up. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So let's agree on let's agree six. on six billion. So um, as we see it over here, this is half fluid, yeah. Just yeah, all right, okay, good. I, I know you know. So six billion base pairs over here. This is upright, yeah. This is just mother or father, yeah. Six so billion. why is it six billion? Mm -hmm. Is it a lot? No, it is not a lot, as you can see. Of course, it's more than we see in most nematodes, plants, and whatever else, yeah. But here, look, some of the uh, some other uh, the, the vertebrates, yeah, like the like the lungfish, has directly forty times more DNA in every cell. Look at this guy here, an amoeba, a unicellular organism, yeah. has easily 300 times more DNA, 200 times more DNA than we have. 200 times more DNA. And maybe they are smarter. Mm -hmm. And they're secretly ruling us. Right, and we just don't know. So, does therefore DNA amount? Does this tell us anything about what we can do or what we cannot do? Probably not. The sheer amount of DNA doesn't matter. It's of course what kind of genes we have and how we easily we can with these genes adapt to the to the remainder of the environment. See, see, amount here does matter. I still believe that the amoeba will not outsmart me. I don't know. Maybe I'm not uh, smart enough for that. But I have this feeling as if a lot of DNA does not tell us too much about, let's say, how do you rise here? So, nevertheless, within these three million, half million, six, million, six billion uh, uh, diploid. Uh, nucleotides, we find therefore quite a lot of stuff to answer our phylogenetic question. Take no entire genomes. And this is what we did in the late 90s already when we took mitochondrial genomes, yeah, the circular own genomes that we have in our mitochondria, and just check the order of the of the genes and find out whether or not we find some phylogenetic patterns here. And yes, if you look at the color pattern here, you see that this group here uh, doesn't have this dark blue, while this dark blue is here in this group. They are monophyletic, they are monophyletic, so it matches nicely. So it got us to at least some stage to some resolutions, but could not answer all questions. However, some other important findings have been made just based on the gene content. Namely, that crustaceans and insects, but they are closely related to each other. And before we had that, the order of the genes, 
we thought that the Miria boats, yeah, the Miria fleet, the Santa fleet, and all these, you know, these, these guys, yeah, that they would be closer to the insects, and we didn't believe that the crustaceans, or lobster, whatever else, would be noticed. But no, the order of mitochondrial genes told us quite a bit. And taking otherwise full chromosomes to compare and full uh, uh, genomes to compare work nicely with rather simple bacteria. Because bacterial genomes are small. They don't have introns, they don't have intergenic regions, they just have gene, 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 all these things with lots of with lots of evolutionary constraints. So easy to compare them with each other. And I don't want to get too much in detail, but you see already these guys, uh, so it's a display, how they are coded, if I turn around or forward red, backwards red. Don't want to get into details, but you see these guys are look closer and they form a monophyletic group. They look more similar, form a monophyletic group. They look more similar, etc. What about us? Homo sapiens. This is six billion base pairs. These six billion base pairs are mostly 99% of our six billion base pairs are coding for nothing, so called junk DNA. Only 1% make up your lovely genes. 1%. So that means we have a gene here, then we have a stretch of nothing, then the next gene. So comparing these things, as we did before in Syria, is a nightmare. We cannot do that. Too much information. And too much rubbish in between. So what we did then instead is we focus only on the protein convention. And we still have a lot of them. How many protein coding genes does Homo sapiens have? And what she said is an overestimation. <laughs> How many protein coding genes? So, good of seeing the eyes, keratin from the hair and from the skin, uh, trypsin, pepsin, which digests my, my nasty domain. Uh, how many protein coding genes do we have? So, make a dedicated guess. Any idea? Any idea? Just say a number. Say again? 50,000, huh? that's not too bad. Any idea? Ah, <laughs> no, no, that's too easy. No. <laughs> okay, more or less. More or less. Is that more? Okay, good. What do you think? 50,000, more or less? Hmm? You think less? Okay. Yes, it's only 25, about 25,000. 25,000, and that's not a lot. When the first genome of Homo sapiens was sequenced in 2001, I guess, we thought we'd be the crown of evolution. You know, we can do anything. And we only have lousy 25,000 protein coding genes. That was a disappointment. Let me sequence sponges. Sponges. You know, sitting somewhere in the colony, doing nothing but pumping. How many protein coding genes do you think sponges have? They have 37 sponges. <laughs> Why 50% uh, more than Homo sapiens? Are they secretly ruling us? We do. We know. Okay. We don't know if these are active, these genes. We don't know how they are expressed. However, after sequencing them, we suddenly notice there are much more protein coding genes than we Homo sapiens. My goodness, this was not very good, good for human uh, self confidence. Anyway. Independent from that, 
Let's focus on putting coding genes because now suddenly with these 25,000 respectively 37,000 responders, we have lots of data. So let's use it. So we just take these putting coding genes and make data sets out of that. Yes, we just take no, not that crap in between. We just take the genes themselves. And we suddenly have not nine genes. We have we can take hundreds, thousands, or whatever is in our distribution. How do we analyze now this huge amount of data? Two possibilities. <laughs> we can make super matrices or we can make super chips. A super matrix. So likewise, hopefully bring up the other pieces as a super tree star. So we have to get from here. Now somehow here we have these two approaches. What's the difference? The super matrix takes out of this data set here with all its putting information, A C G and T or cyclic amino acid. Out of which we little stuff. Alternatively, we can also take every single gene independently. So we make therefore hundreds of different gene trees and analyze them separately in an approach, so called the super tree approach, and hope to get the species tree. How does it look in, in detail? The super matrix, how does it look like? We have therefore. Data set at concatenated two data sets, two data sets, everything attached to each other. We might not get for every protein, sorry, for every single organism, all kinds of uh, every single um, every single gene. So if we browse through here, we might see large stretches for some organisms without. Here depicted, these are all the organisms. These are all the individual genes. This is a huge data set consisting out of hundreds of thousands of characters, uh, of thousands of different um, um, and, uh, genes. Blue is where we have all the information. White is where we do not have this information. This is what the trouble starts. So this guy is where we do not have the information. Might therefore negatively our results because there's hardly anything compared. Technically, it's pretty difficult to get all kinds of and pretty elaborate to get all kinds of information for every single organism. So we always end up with some gaps here, leading to some trouble. Likewise, with the super trees, we have also to do some detours. We reconstruct nicely for every single data set of all our thousands of genes that we use. But we have then to recode everything so we get one big super tree of all those data points that we have. This recoding causes also quite some pitfalls. So, in total, those approaches have some advantages. Disadvantage. I don't want to go too much into detail here what that is, but this is the way we currently approach with so called phylogenomic data our question of the evolution of the different organisms. And when that came up, the phylogenomics, lots of papers were published continuously, lots of papers. Now, using entire genomes, therefore, now, finally, believing that these questions would be resolved, you can count how frequently the name resolved was on the titles of this paper. Here, uh, among these mammals here, here, revolu uh, resolving evolutionary relationships of morals, resolving arthropods, and finally resolving here uh, these kind of unicellular organisms, and whatever else we solved, we believe we would have outsmarted now, finally, all the trouble. These paper got published into highest ranking journals. Nature, September 22, 2011. Finally, finding, resolving uh, the, the molluscan relationships. 
the ancient old question, who is closer well to who? Bivalves to gastropods, so, 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 so mollusks to, to, to snails, and the scaphopods, so those um, bastards, I guess they're, they're called in English, would be just uh, uh, coming, uh, uh, split it off earlier from the last common ancestor here. So now finally we can understand how the shell evolved, yeah, with the, with the two valves or just with the torsion over here. What G, what has been responsible for that? Published in Nature, one of the highest ranking, the huge impact factor, September 23. Now. Three months later. In Germany. Three issues later. Another paper. Resolving the evolutionary relationship of the mother. What do we do? Here now, gastropods are closer to the scapopods. My goodness. Three months. Highest ranking journal. And the tree is already, the two are already in front So, Biogenomics obviously seems to get the same problems as what we had with the gene free species. Other example, even deeper clays. Um, who's closer related to us, Yeah, the butterflies, the Homo sapiens, the arthropods, everything else which is not sponge protozoan or, or whatever else. Nature, November 16. 2015, suggesting that sponges would be closer to the bilaterian and Stino fourth branch earlier. Stino at the base of the tree. Two weeks later, different tree. Bilaterian Stino fourth sponge. This is a high ranking journal, not as high ranking as science or nature. Who knows what PNAS stands for? No, 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 it actually stands for Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, but we also call it published but not accepted in science. So it's still, you know, high ranking, but uh, yeah, slightly not nature or science. Yeah, so still very good. So if you happen to have a paper in there, at least a paper which is not, you know, uh, changing its content within the next two weeks. Well, that, that would be very good. But you see, these things change. Although both use phylogenetic methods, but it's a different suite of uh, suite of uh, taxa and character, different approaches, but still incongruent. Mm. We have a trouble. We have trouble to resolve incongruent incongruent in deep time. That means when there have been very uh, very so deep time at uh, hundreds of million years ago, very subtle changes from where an old organism split us from each other, we might therefore have trouble to respond. Here, full genetic data set of a bunch of uh, primates, and they checked here every hundred base pairs of the genome. What is a phylogenetic tree? from this individual data set. And you see every potential phylogenetic tree was recapitulated to a certain percentage. So there's phylogenetic information basically everywhere for every kind of scenario, hypothetical scenario that you have here. This one, the most likely, obviously, is only 15.5% uh, uh, frequently in the resulting trees. Others, however, almost equal, although the phylogeny is different. If you would even go deeper in time, if you take a data set consisting out of 44 genes, if you analyze it properly, you find a lot of characters which show, therefore, independently, if you take not 44, but just fewer genes that show all kinds of phylogenetic relationship possibilities. Here, from the 294 characters of this data set here, 
yeah, still 106, almost a third, uh, more than a third, yeah, suggest that lungfish and silicon area is closer to other frequencies. Almost a third as well suggest this one, and almost a third suggest this one here. Also on the base of the animal two, where we try to understand who split off first from the last common ancestor of all animals, sponges or placozoans or bacteria or, or peripheral. Biodynamic data sets lots of different phylogeny because different and different approaches. So the problem is, we still, even if we have now lots of data, we still have to be careful. We have to be careful that we choose data, taxa, which do not have these long branches, which are not these weirdos in the veins. These long branches, and as you see here, these long branches, therefore, can therefore artificially put two taxa together. Likewise, the distances must not be too short. Why that? This is, let's say, a phylogeny for very deep splits. So this might be 100 years ago. And for example, in, during the Cambrian, uh, Cambrian explosion, you remember maybe from a little bit of paleontology, within a snapshot of 30 million years, suddenly lots of different bow plants and organismal types occurred in the Cambrian. You can show the science. Therefore, it's called uh, Cambrian explosion because obviously mollusks and arthropods and uh, all kinds of completely different looking organisms originate within a window just a few million years. But these few million years have been 540 million years ago. So that means this big bang here, yeah, originated quite a long time ago. And since then, these lineages evolved. If these lineages evolved a too short time ago, then we have only a few characters supporting the relationships. If after the split from the last common ancestors, has been quite a long time until they had split it off. We have lots of characters that can support therefore, the, this split here. However, during these hundreds of million years, we also get controversial data, accidental homoplasies, randomly inferred mutations, which therefore might mess up our original data set here given as dots or as, as x's. If these are more frequent than those changes, those characters, which have the true signal, because this error is encountered as if it would be true. If, however, we would have the branches which have lots of data, good data, these few homoplasies, so those random errors, do not actually interfere with all. Likewise, you're going, you're going to learn a lot about molecular evolutionary reconstruction algorithms, like maximum likelihood algorithms, Bayesian algorithms. The choice of the best algorithm makes a lot in the organic functions. The choice of a different algorithm here with different data sets asking the question who's been branching first during the evolution of, all of, of animals leads to completely different results. Here, different model from here. Here, you see that the comp jellies, yeah, kind of jellyfish. Uh, uh, jellyfish uh, looking like uh, organisms, steerless metaphors, would be not branching before the sponges. Here, the sponges are branching second, and suggesting that the comb jellies are therefore branching first. With the same data set, however, a different evolutionary model. So choose your model wise, because the choice of your model even will be crucial to 
that's the correct sequence. Good. One last thing. So far, we mostly focusing on total encoding regions. We can, however, also focus a little bit on those other genomic regions, on those junk DNA that we have in this. But this would go probably for today a little bit too far. I will talk a little bit about that next Friday in the uh, in the in the lecture, whatever it was around. Uh, but which is which is broadcastable as well. So I don't want to get too much into the details here. Just to let you know, there are also things in the junk DNA, well, in the junk DNA, so-called ultra-conserved elements, which help us to understand even better than the protein coding gene uh, how relationships between organisms. But the full genomes, also. They are mostly now used for phylogeny. Can also now these days be used for species descriptions. What is Who knows this organism? Who knows the phylum? What we look at here? It's an animal. But what animal phylum? What is it? Somewhere it's pretty early branching from the last common ancestor. Who's branching first from the last common ancestor of all animals? What are the most primitive animals? Okay. Oh, hey. Second. Most primitive, having having eyes and nose and can hear and breathe and feel and uh, run and uh, they are primitive. I can talk about much more primitive animal. Think out of the box. Animals not necessarily need to have legs or eyes. They probably they probably split first from the last from the ancestor of something like. 600, 700, maybe 800 million years ago. Reptiles are uh, later. These ones here are also branching relatively early. This guy here is a Hong Kong Kangen. It's a Prakozoa. Have you heard of Prakozoa? Creature Prax. Have you heard of Prakozoa? Very simple animal. Consisting only out of two tissue layers, yeah, endoderm and ectoderm. And what they do is actually not a lot. However, they've been branching probably very early from the last common ancestor of all animals. Animals here, all these guys here. The last common ancestor, probably sponges branch of first, yeah, and then maybe nidarians, corals, and anemones, and then all these guys, jellyfishes. Uh, stenophores or the comb jellies are just talking about maybe these can be black buckles. These buckles are ones, they are pretty enigmatic due to the fact that they are just small, they don't do quite a lot. This is an any, this is a very old movie of the Pacosons. Pacosons, 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 Pacosons. So they're just crawling, they're changing, their morphs, yeah? Uh, these are just food, they're just unicellular food for these colonies. So you see, they are just amoebae moving, although they're not amoeba, they're multicellular organisms. So they're very primitive makeup so far, yeah? Consisting out of just two different cell layers. So no, uh, no, um, Mesoderm, no muscles, no nothing at all. You can imagine it is pretty difficult to come up with species description. So until the 
So until the movie goes on and on, until the 19, um, no, sorry, until the 1910s, 1920s, these organisms were now. They were found by accident somewhere and uh, therefore only described as just one single species. Now, with molecules, sorry, by the way, they're very tiny, yeah, so you have to uh, take a very good look at them. So now with molecular tools, we notice there's lots of different types of lineages, molecular lineages. Let's see, together here with which they are crawling at the substrate so far. But these individual lineages should be now described as species. And now try to describe different species out of an organism which is continuously changing its shape. We therefore now used genomic inputs and sequence the completed genomes of the original Trichoplax and the new species described with Alumia hongkong And we noted that the genomes are not particularly long. I guess something like, well, I don't know how long they are in total, but the, but the genes and the gene regions between this one here and the new species are completely differently uh, arranged. So here is the so far known organism, and here the, the new species. And you see, it has some of these black elements, which are actually coming from complete different chromosomes. This red one here is actually belonging to this chromosome, but this red region here is on a complete different strand of DNA, so-called symptomy, checking how parallel the coding of the DNA between two organisms is. This is one organism, this is the next organism. These are, these are the DNA strands with the individual genes on them. So this is matching nicely, this is matching nicely. Here, however, still nicely, but this region is translocated over here in this one here. This region here is actually coming from what this species has over here. It's a lot of exchanges in the chromosomes, in the genome. And quantifying these exchanges is a good way to show, hey guys, this is something completely different. This cannot occur within the same species, maybe not even within the same genus, and therefore we talk about two different, completely different images. This is just to give you a kind of example how therefore this kind of genome arrangement can also help us with molecular phylogenies and with in taxonomy if necessary. So that means Although we are very enthusiastic now in the genomic area about additional data that we get, that help us how to, to understand how things evolved, how characters evolved, how new traits originate, we are still at the very beginning of understanding how life originated and how life is distributed on us and how genomic how genes, genomes originated, and how therefore everything changes throughout time. Therefore, it is particular for you a pretty exciting time. Now we get more and more data. We just need more and more ways how to get these individual data types, the genome data, how to compact them and how to understand and how to work with it better to solve the last couple of riddles that we still have in organismal evolution. And with this, I'd like to finish. And I hope I gave you a small insight into benefits, but also pitfalls. Please keep in mind, although we know a lot already, still a lot to learn and still a lot to improve. And until we have a time machine, we still have to find some better ways out of the control of the data 
to understand the diversity that we have here on Earth. And therefore, if you're interested in understanding evolution, this is becoming a pretty golden era. You said. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dill, uh, Professor Edward Beck. So uh, we are finished on time, but uh, is it any comments, maybe, or question one or two, maybe? Because, yeah, this is interesting. Like uh, uh, Professor Edward Beck said that, yeah, no one is uh, completely, how you call it, the perfect one, which I suppose it was perfect using molecular tools or molecular yeah molecular gene or something like that but in fact with this there is still pitfall so also not so many information but in my opinion it's still the best or the most ubiquitous one for the uh, the yeah saving time or better you just using the morpho morphological character or something like that especially when we learn about biodiversity so is it any some comment maybe from students? One? Or you can take tell about the bacteria or something, yeah, some things, or or you can ask about hey sir, I'm have a genome of plants or bacteria, and how about the environment influence that you can give comments if there is no, no question, please. Comment is also okay. Don't worry, I'm, I'm still around for a couple of weeks yeah. here. So if some questions originally. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, giving the insight for us about the phylogenetics. Uh, how, how we know the, the step by step from the uh, the basic theory of how phylogenetics works, and then uh, it's uh, uh, for me it's new insight for. But uh, my uh, my my uh, final doctoral thesis uh, before is about bioinformatics, and I uh, I did a lot uh, work in uh, sequ uh, not sequencing, not uh, it's like. Uh, Make our phylogenetic from the established data database from NCBI, and uh, from this course, I already know about the uh, uh, the evolution, the basic evolution of, uh, behind the phylogenetics, and that's uh, that's uh, for me it is very informative. Thank you for your comment. Um... Particularly, if you know into bioinformatics, this is a gold mine currently. Yeah, because we have lots of data. Sequencing complete genomes is getting very easy. Getting the raw data is very easy these days. And it's getting, I wouldn't say cheap, but considerably cheaper than 10 years ago. But what to do with all this data, the analysis of this data? Yeah, there's still a lot of things to, to improve. Yeah, and if you're good in programming and you can come up with good pipelines to analyze, or to, to, to dissect out of, uh, to di digest out of the data all the answers that we'd like to have, with this, you can actually make a pretty good career if you're good in that. Yeah, so I guess if I would be uh, 30, 40 years younger, I think I would uh, you know, do a path rather in bioinformatics. Okay, good. Uh, my for my thesis, I will do on the uh, not not taxonomies again. <laughs> I will work on the uh, extraction of uh, phenol. Yeah, completely different from my previous uh, okay, thesis. Okay. What? It broadens your horizon, <laughs> doing lots of different things. That's what study does for. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe I, I will work a lot 
on the transcription level of some genes. Okay. Uh, Oh, sorry, I really can like I really want to know because I heard that human in the past time can produce their their own essential vitamin C. They can human yeah. in the before the last ice age, yeah. they can produce um their essential vitamin C yeah. from their coding protein genes. And how the researcher can really assume that we can produce our own vitamin C in the back time. But because right now we cannot produce it for ourselves. And I want to know that if, it, if there are any probabilities that we can produce or have that typical of genes again in our body in the future or no? The second one would be speculative. I would say yes, it will be possible. It's possible to introduce genes that do the important thing. What is currently still problematic, how to regulate this by, by law? Yeah, of course, uh, we don't want to make now the super duper uh, bionic man or bionic woman uh, that has all the superpowers and can misuse it or whatever. So this would be the ethical thing is completely different, but it's really a topic. Why do we know that we could do that and lost it? It's probably because we can compare all those genes with other organisms. So we know which genes are producing vitamin C, which is in other organisms. We can trace back the uh, signature of the gene, so uh, the nucleotides, think in our own genome. Then we suddenly notice there must have been maybe a mutation for any kind of reason that switched our function, uh, that switched off the chance that we produce vitamin C ourselves. We can see that. So we, we see that. Um, the uh, the genetic code is not resulting in functional protein. Or maybe that they are promoters or other things inhibiting. This is something we could, in theory, see in the genome. And we can do experimental results and see after cloning this gene, for example, if it's really causing an excess protein. Model. So therefore, we can deduct that at a certain moment, we might have had this gene in excess. Then there might have been maybe a nasty mutation which actually switched it off and only left those among us uh, alive which, that were able to pick fruit or pick up any kind of, of artificial um, sources of vitamin C. So we still can't continue to survive. This would be my guess. Yeah, does it answer your question? Yeah, I think. Okay, Dirk, it's almost uh, finished. No, uh, no more question or still some? Yeah, he is still around for one or two weeks. So if you are interested, yeah, you can ask directly to his room. Just go to in front of Budini's room. So he's in one or two weeks stay, still staying here. So if you have any some, yeah, maybe for your purpose of your thesis, you want to make some introduction or something like on consultation, just feel free. Yes, my door, although my door looks closed, it is, it's open for you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks. Good. Otherwise, good luck with your further endeavors in this master program. And uh, I hope to meet you at some time, somewhere, somehow in science. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Good. Plus, thank you. Can I make a picture, maybe? Yeah, last one with the remote picture. So, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Just,
All right. No All right. Thank you. 